uh, you were telling a story uh, uh, before we broke uh, the change cassette. Uh, it's dangerous when you break two minutes for me. I might forget what story <laughs> I was telling. <laughs> it's dangerous for me, too, and I'm trying to remember. Oh, I was doing the <laughs> show with Harry Belafonte and Lena right. Horne, which was a treat. And uh, I got involved with the executive producing the show, a guy, a producer named Chiz Schultz, who I don't. And uh, I had to come up with a complete script and, and every word written and, and the name, the words of every song. They wanted the wor whole words of every song in my script. So it was a big, fat script. I'll put the names of the songs in. was easy. But uh, the words to the song. So uh, I'd come in, and they were fussing with my script, changing the words I'd written, you know, making little diddly things. And I probably said that great line of Fred Allen's, where were they when the paper was blank? <laughs> but uh, uh, so one day I came in, and they were making a couple of diddly little corrections or what they thought were improvements in my script. So I took the script back, and one of the songs that Harry Belafonte sang was Stormy Weather. So when I'm redoing the script, I make a few changes in the words to Stormy Weather. And so we come back into the thing. I, somebody says, Pete, what, what, this, these aren't the words to Stormy Weather. I said, well, I just made a few changes in them. I thought I'd improve Stormy Weather a little bit. <laughs> they were furious. <laughs> I was kidding, of course. <laughs> Those uh, those uh, documentaries on Black America that were uh, uh, telecast back w what period of time, roughly? Now, you keep doing that to me. I know. Well, I'm I don't terrible know what about period. This. If you have the information, uh, tell me, and I'll say yes. I, I don't think, know. Well, I don't have that information. Is the reason I'm asking you. It looks like 1968, from uh, yeah. what I can tell. Mm -hmm. So. Since that is an obviously a period of uh, '68 in particular uh, was a monumental year in terms of the social change and uh, mm -hmm. and, and the assassinations and everything else, uh, were there any problems getting that show on the air that you recall? Oh, there were no problems. As a matter of fact, uh, CBS jumped to do it. We were all bending over backwards to to right this wrong we all agreed had been done for so many years and and uh, uh, that might have been the biggest problem with it that mm. we shouldn't have gone that far because it was a bending over backwards but they were they were good shows and it, it was I'm never f in favor of doing shows that are really useful I don't think that's anything a journalist should set out to do I mean you don't set out to do good in any obvious way except by revealing information. But uh, these shows did a lot of good, and they, they were, they, uh, by some small way, they helped. Do you think uh, writing those shows, I mean, I think anyone over the age of 45 or 50 in this country certainly had a, had a sort of a blank spot in their education when they were growing up about black history because we, uh, as a white person, we weren't taught uh, black history, uh, particularly a particular <coughs> age group. Say. And, and, and uh, I think something that you don't say is that blacks were inhibited from having as much history as whites were having. They did not get the opportunity to emerge and be leaders that the whites did. So to some extent, they had less history. And, and even what they had w was lost or obscured in many cases. I guess what I'm asking is, uh, in coming up with the information to do this show, what kind of changes or uh, did uh, do you think that it had on you in terms of your view of the uh, African American role in history? Did those, was it a learning experience for you? No, it didn't have any any effect whatsoever. I didn't. I don't think I learned anything. I didn't know or or gained any opinions I didn't already have. I was never embarrassed or never hid any feelings I had about, about black Americans or black any other way. I, I felt I had no sense of superiority ever, and I, I um, object to some black actions in certain segments of the society, but I, I am 
absolutely without guilt in any, any feeling I had about it. I, I could not say that about some other things. I, I grew up with, with the same homosexual bias that most American males had. I, I called them pansies and fags and fairies. And uh, I was slow learning uh, uh, about that, 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 that this was seriously wrong. And I am embarrassed about that now. But I have never had any reason to be embarrassed about any feelings I had about black and That just wasn't in your background. No. Did you win, a, win an Emmy Award from that series? I probably did. I think you did. Yeah, my understanding Listen, is. Listen, if you're in this business as long as I am, you win all the awards. The trouble is, you know, you have to apply for most awards. Mm -hmm. And you get sort of, you don't apply anymore, so you don't get any more. <laughs> I I've I've won some awards, but uh, well, did the Emmy have any special meaning to you? Gee, I, I I know the answer to that question is yes. The <laughs> Emmy had a very special meaning for me. <laughs> no, That's no, what's I, called a leading question. I don't. It it did not. I know. I mean, it, you're always interested and flattered to get an award, but uh, they do they do. I mean, there are more awards to be given than there are people who deserve to get them. <laughs> Not only in television, but in life generally. Well, you worked on a, a program called An Essay on War. You recall that? What do you mean do I recall? It? Yes, yeah. that I recall. It was one of the seminal works of my life in television. Well, let's talk about that. Well, I, I had such an intense experience in World War II. I mean, I was in the Army for four years while I grew up, and uh, I saw World War II like very few people ever saw it. I had an opportunity to go anywhere and to look at what I wanted to look at. I could go where the action was every day. There are very few people who saw World War II as I saw, as much of it as I saw. And this was such a big part of my, of my life, and I had so many thoughts in my brain about it that as a writer I wanted to get them out and because I was working in television I wanted to get them out in television so I got the pictures together and put together this piece I was still not doing my own and I I did it for and Harry Reasoner read it originally and uh, the producer uh, thought, I don't know, he didn't like it. And who, who was the producer? Don Hewitt. And uh, he chopped it up. And Don Hewitt has always been chopping up my pieces all my life. <laughs> <laughs> and he, nine times out of ten, he improves. I hate to say that. I don't like to flatter him, but he's very good. But he didn't do it to this one. He ruined it, in my view. And I have the correct view too. And uh, so I was so mad that I stomped off. I quit CBS. And I got them. They were a little embarrassed. So I, I bought it from CBS. I paid them about what it had cost, which was, I don't know, $25,000, not much. And I paid CBS for that. And I sold it to uh, public television. Fred Friendly was then running uh, public w, uh, C, the public television station in New York. And uh, he, they bought it for me for more than I had paid. And then they, the Encyclopedia Britannica Film Division bought it from them to syndicate it around the country. And it was bought by two or three hundred schools across the country. And, um, first time I ever made a lot of money. But that was the version that you wanted. Yes, yeah. that was the original version. So CBS didn't reject the show. You just didn't accept the work that Hewitt had done on it. Is that correct? Well, they objected it as they rejected it as I had done it. Oh, they rejected, I see. They okay. wanted to run it there. I mean, I, I very seldom now, if I do a piece for 60 Minutes, and Don wants changes. I usually make them. 
because he's usually right. And on a couple of occasions every year, it happens. I say, Don, I'm not going to do that. I don't want to make that change. You, uh, I'll do another piece, but I'm not going to change this one. And he, he, he invariably, he says, if you feel that strongly about it, fine. We'll use it as it is. So I have not had that kind of problem with him. At that time, you took the show, that particular show, away from CBS and went to PBS. You didn't leave the employment of CBS, though, did you, at that time? Was that, is that the s sequence? I should have yeah. somebody write, write my life history so I could look at it and study. I understand. I understand. I, I, don't, I don't remember. I, it may have been I, when I left. Yes, I think I did. Because so the I went, information I have is that you yes, may have departed. I went to, uh, after that, I sold them that and went to public television and wrote a show called The Great American Dream Machine, which was one of the... Jack Willis. Jack Willis, who broke his back early in a surfing accident, did it originally. And it was a very good show, and I, I enjoyed working on that. And I broke out more in that. I started doing, really, what I do for 60 Minutes now. I, I wrote some for other people, but I, I did a couple of my own. First time I had done anything on on television. I remember I did a, a piece I could do it today for 60 minutes. I did a, I got all the labels I could find in a store w where the maker of the product, the food product, had won an, an award that they had put on it. And then a Golden's Gold Medal Award, the Columbia Exposition of 1872. <laughs> you know, I said, yeah, but what have they won lately? You know, I, but I, I, so I did some things there on camera myself. Well, tell us a little bit about what was the Great American Dream Machine about? Well, it wasn't about anything. It was, uh, it, they just, it was a magazine type show and it, it just covered a the broad variety. Uh, it, it was, had more entertainment elements in it than 60 Minutes has, but uh, it was basically a magazine show mm -hmm. and they had a lot of interesting people and, uh, not many stars doing it either. It was popular. It was it got wide critical acclaim. I very much enjoyed working on Did it. Did you enjoy being on camera? Well, I had never I had never had any great desire to be on camera. People don't believe me when I say that. And I I have even less desire now because I I uh, I am not a a very comfortable, well-known person. I, I do not accept well-knownness graciously. I, I don't know why. Uh, Cronkite is so good about it. He's nice to strangers he meets on the street. And I could kick him sometimes <laughs> because he's so nice and I'm so nasty. But I mean, it's just something different in our character. And I am just embarrassed and I, I just want to crawl away. You know, I, I, I was in San Francisco years ago and I, I have higher visibility some places than others, but everybody in San Francisco walking down the street knew me and stopped me. So I went into the cable car clothiers, a place I like, and I bought this expensive hat with a peak on it, and I pulled the hat down over my eyes, and I walked out on the street. The first guy comes along and says, Hey, Andy, where'd you get the hat? <laughs> <laughs> Just wasted $27. <laughs> But what'd you ask me? I forget. Well, you weren't seeking any. You were obviously weren't seeking any personal recognition. Oh being no, on I was not. I was. Uh. I, I was. <laughs> I was already known in the industry as a writer, and I liked that a lot. Uh -huh. I, all my peers knew me. Everybody in the business knew me as a writer, mm -hmm. and it's it's really. I mean, we all are looking for approbation and satisfaction in, in that regard, and I like being known. But uh, having added. 50 million strangers who know me now has, has not been a great source of amusement to me. Money's good, but there isn't much else to be said for it. You know, it's hard to go anywhere, and, and even the, the people on the street who try and be polite bug me because they, you know, they see they, they don't, they're determined not to bother me, which is nice of them, but they, you see them and they're, they know you, they've, they've caught you. And it's it's very small of me, but even that bothers me. And you know, the autograph business, I just have never signed my autograph. And I often say, if I give you one, you'll be the first one. 
I just do not do it. When I write a book, I sign my book. I think that's a nice thing to do. But to give some idiot my name on a blank piece of paper, for what? I mean, I just don't do it for anybody dumb enough to want my autograph. You know, one benefit of fame, I know, uh, when you were in Austin, Texas, uh, uh, the, the taxi driver that took you to uh, campus uh, uh, didn't want to, uh, you to pay his uh, fare. You remember that? <laughs> that's right. That's nice. I so that's one benefit of, of fame. Uh, but did you make the decision to go on, uh, to be on camera for the Great American Dream Machine, or were you talked into it? or, or cause it Well, I was, I was short of... Uh, a star. I mean, Harry Reasoner was over at ABC, and uh, there was not, uh, no one else to read my stuff, so I did it. So it just happened, so, so yeah. it was big. Now, uh, then you, you went to work for ABC in 1972. Yeah, Harry Reasoner had gone there, and he wanted me to come over, and I went there to do some documentaries for him at ABC. As a writer? Yes, do writer. producer, writer. Uh, did you have, was that a hard decision to make? Well, it wasn't because after the Dream Machine I needed a job and I wanted, I was interested in getting back with Harry. And uh, so I went to ABC and I had a good time there. But I, I, was, I was away from CBS a total of, I don't think, two years. Mm -hmm. And I went down to the, one of the conventions in Florida with ABC writing convention stuff. <coughs> And uh, there was a New York Giants game on while we were down there, and I wanted to see it. And CBS had it on their monitors in the closed circuit in their area of our convention offices. And I met Dick Salant, the president of CBS News, and I said, hey, you got the game on over there. Could I come over? Even though I left CBS, it was a baby. He said, oh, sure, come on over. So I watched the Giants game at the CBS offices. And so afterwards, Dick put his arm around me and he said, why don't you come back home for good? So I did. And that's how that I happened. left ABC and came back to CBS. Very interesting. How, why did Harry Reasoner leave CBS? Well, uh, for one thing, you don't replace Walter Cronkite. I mean, the aim of everybody who did what Harry did was to be the premier anchor man, and Harry could have done it. But Walter was ensconced in that seat. Nobody was going to replace Walter. And they were too close of an age for Harry to be his successor. Harry was largely younger. So he, he saw an opportunity to be the, the anchor man on a network television broadcast. So that's why he left CBS. Uh, he, was, he was having a sort of a hard time at 60 Minutes. He was having to work pretty hard. Didn't like that that much. Here's, you know, being an anchor man. I guess I won't say that about anchor man. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a lot of money in it for the work involved. Most of the work involved, the hardest work an anchor man has is not the work he does on camera on the show. I mean, demands on, for instance, Dan Rather's time is monumental. I mean, he's, I, I can't believe the number of in invitations he gets, and some of them quite persuasive, people who want him to do good things. Walter still does does three or four dinners a night honoring him or honoring somebody else that he appears at. Before we leave, before you left ABC and went back to CBS, uh, the, some of the documentaries that you did for ABC included A Bird's Eye View of California, uh, which was be what well, that was a similar sort of thing just for California mm -hmm. that you had done earlier. Yes, but you also did that small town in Iowa show that you. CBS to. Uh, was going to sue ABC too because I had done a bird's eye view first for CBS and they thought they had proprietary rights to the name a bird's eye view of. Oh, how did you get away from that? I don't know. It went away. I guess I said it was silly and they decided it probably was silly. I don't remember the detail. But then you also did a small town in Iowa that we referred to earlier. At ABC, that was part of yes. ABC and I did, as well. I did one on something called the Vandals too. Yes. People who wantonly destroy things for no reason. It was sort of a weak hour, I suppose. I don't remember. Oh, and then I did a, a the best thing I did. Well, I did two good things there. The Bird's Eye View of Scotland, and I did an essay on churches. It was church architecture. 
and uh, I had all the grand churches of the world with the great windows and and uh, and the quite homely churches too, mm -hmm. and uh, I had a lot of things to say. And that was still on ABC, right? That was yeah. ABC. I had a lot of things to say about churches in general, you know, as an essayist. Well, you you told that charming story about Dick Salant and the New York Giants football team. Uh, let's talk about Dick Salant a minute, because uh, that's another he's another important figure in mm -hmm. the history of television news. Uh, evaluate him for us. I mean, what were his strengths and weaknesses? What was it like to work with him? Well, I knew a lot of very big people who were executives at, in the CBS News Department. Fred Friendly, uh, Dick Salant. Bud Benjamin, Bill Leonard, and uh, Dick Salant was a lawyer. Fred Friendly came in, and he was a great CBS News president. He got into a big argument about he wanted to take the hearings on on those islands over near in the Far East that we had. We were had military action over there, and it was a big issue about whether we give the islands back or not to the ta to Taiwan and uh, to China. And uh, there were hearings in Congress, and it was so important. Fred Friendly thought it was so important that uh, they should be broadcast live in the morning, and it meant preempting soap operas, which were big money winners, and uh, CBS. Refused and said he couldn't. Oh, Andy, I think you're thinking about the Fulbright hearings of Vietnam, the Senate hearings, and not Kamoi Matsu. You're thinking about Kamoi Matsu, but I think you're thinking about the the Senate uh, Foreign Relations Committee hearings of Vietnam. But anyway, that's just for the record. It's for the record, but I think you're wrong. I could very well be wrong, <laughs> and, and I'm I not, readily I'm admit not that. sure either. I think it was Kamoi Matsu. Okay. I think it was hearings on that. If it was Fulbright, because this would be like I believe it was like '65 or '66, yeah. so that would be the Vietnamese War. But anyway, I just wanted to. Yeah, I could. Well yeah, be wrong. yeah. Uh, uh, so, um, where was I? Well, you were talking about that they wanted to. Uh, uh, Fred. Fred. Uh, quit over that issue. And uh, Dick Salant was a lawyer and a very good friend of the president of the network, Frank Stanton. And uh, I think Dr. Stanton, I was still calling him doctor instead of Frank, um, you get closer to a person's age as you get older, even though they're older than you are. And uh, Frank Stanton chose this good lawyer in the CBS Law Department, Frank Stan uh, Dick Salant. And Dick came in as president of CBS News, and we were all suspicious of him because he had no news background. Well, he was just not an average news president. He was a great news president. And interesting, I don't know whether anybody else would say this about Dick. He was not a great doer. Dick Salant did not have, as Fred Friendly did, a million ideas, good ideas about what to do. Dick Salant had a rock solid base belief in what we should not do. He, I mean, he was a fortress. You could not get anything by him that was suggestive of anything unethical in news. He would have nothing to do with anybody who was did anything at all wrong. One of our correspondents in Los Angeles, good one, Terry Drinkwater, was doing a piece on hitchhiking, which seems to have disappeared in America, by the way. And he was had a camera crew, and he wanted to photograph some hitchhikers. And he had a bunch of hitchhikers. And his daughter was in college, and he put his daughter in with a group of hitchhikers to take pictures of them. Dick Salant found out that he had staged this to the extent of putting his daughter in. Terry Drinkwater was suspended. And, but Dick Salant would just have nothing to do with anything at all journalistically unethical or even marginally unethical. He was just a, a giant. He drew up the original CBS standards and uh, we 
still pretend to live to buy them, but we do not. Very interesting. Well, let's talk about some of the documentaries you did. After you returned to CBS. Yeah, I'd rather talk about that. <laughs> I left ABC. Uh, you did uh, Mr. Rooney Goes to Washington. Uh, how, how did that, uh, what was that show about? I mean, as far as uh, what you're trying to do with, with Mr. Rooney well, Goes to Washington. Uh, a little embarrassed about that name. That was Bill Leonard's name for it. It, it, could, it was okay name. But I went down as a reporter, and I, I had a camera crew. I spent five months. I lived in Washington. And I had thought originally that uh, there was a great deal to be exposed about the relationship between business and government. I mean, big business always claims that it hates big government. The fact of the matter is, big business in America is in business with big government. They are close like this. They don't like to admit it. But big business would go out of business if it were not for big government. There I go with the subjunctive. See, it just falls out. <laughs> but uh, uh, I, I, and I set out to document that. And I ended up doing more, really, I did some on that, but it was more a piece about the, the bureaucracy. And it was a lot of fun. I, I got some, some great stuff about how the bureaucracy works. We, we filmed the Marine Band going to 50 different ceremonies. You know, you just whistle and the Marine Band comes. Da, 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 da. Hey, we heard that played a thousand times. It, events they go to, and it's just a ridiculous formality. Then we, for instance, once we went to, um, they had a banquet to give awards to some government office, and they had, they had established an office to save paper. Somebody decided they were producing too much paper, and they had a paper-saving award, and they had stacks of paper. They, they had Xeroxed these awards, and they had 10,000 pages of papers honoring the paper saving. Uh, I mean, we got stuff like this that was just priceless, and we just fell into it. If you, if you have a camera crew for long enough and can get natural stuff happening, it's pretty easy to get a, a good documentary. That was, very, that was one of the good shows. It was more repertorial. I, the other things I had done had been essays, and I like those best because I can just write them. I am embarrassed getting information sometimes because I'm not too good pressing people the way Mike Wallace does for embarrassing answers. I'm not too good at that. Well, you did uh, a whole series of these Mr. Rooney shows, right? Uh, one, uh, Mr. Rooney Goes to Dinner, that's more of the essay type. I it guess. was more essay. It was I did a piece about it was eating out in America. That was a tough show to do, but we just traveled across the country eating in a lot of good restaurants. And, and but it was essay style too. You know, I I had a, a list of places I never eat. I I never eat if it's called the best restaurant in town and it's on top of the tallest building. I don't eat there, particularly if it turns. <laughs> and I don't eat in any restaurant where it has a sign in the window saying waiters wanted. And uh, I don't eat in any restaurant that says home cooking. If I want home cooking, I'll damn well eat at home. But it was essay style in that regard. And you did uh, Mr. Rooney Goes to Work. And I did a show called Colleges. I did a piece on the colleges and, in America. And then New York, New York, was sort of in praise of New York. In praise of New York City was, I would say, if I had to say the best thing I have ever done, it would be in praise of New York City. Well, sort of provincial, but... Uh, uh, that and the Washington Show and uh, Bird's Eye View of Scotland, I like the most. Oh, those are those would be your. I think so. Yeah. Well, at this, I think this is a good point to to change cassette, and we'll go into sixty minutes. <laughs>